Thank you. Thank you. I'm deeply honored and proud to be here tonight with all of you. It is always like a family reunion, uh, coming to gatherings like this, and in particular uh, with the Heritage Foundation, the Franklin Institute, Franklin Center, and pardon me, I got up at 2 o'clock this morning, and I have had many tall co cups of coffee, uh, the Franklin Center, and um, here, of course, uh, to talk about the future of media um, and gathered here to, to honor Andrew Breitbart. So thank you, especially here to Larry Sullivan, Steve Bannon, all the people who are with the Breitbart organization and um, alumni thereof, and of course every one of us who has been touched by his spirit. Um, I've been in this fight a long time, as, as um, Jim has mentioned, and over the years I've worked with or been affected by or been influenced by so many of you here in this room who has, have worked at the most important level, the local and state level, to reclaim local control of our lives and our liberty. For me, over the last 20 years, every day has been about counting my blessings remembering what my parents who came here from the Philippines legally in 1970 taught me. And that is to remember that living here is a privilege, an absolute privilege to live here in this land of opportunity and to marvel in wonder and in awe at the fact that a little girl with brown skin whose parents had no connections or ties or crony special interests, was able to make a living for herself running her big mouth. <laughs> Only in America. It annoys me to no end when I see so many people in Washington on both sides of the aisle blabber about the American dream as if it's some sort of cliché, when for so many people it remains their lives, their reality. One thing that um, Andrew Breitbart and I shared was the common experience of going to college in the late 1980s when the progressive left and the rabid anti-Americans uh, influences really coming to their own and identity politics and political correctness and multiculturalism were infusing college campuses everywhere. And when I went to college, believe it or not, I went to Oberlin College in Ohio, originally to appease my mother who wanted me to be a classical pianist. <laughs> If you see my Vine videos, though, it still does pay off. <clears throat> uh, and I had not been as loud-mouthed as I am today, and I have Oberlin to thank for that. <laughs> but more than the Oberlin miseducation, it was the fact that there was a conservative presence on these campuses. And it was an oasis and sanctuary to me that there were caring conservatives that understood that those of us who were isolated in these cesspools of, of tenured radicalism needed intellectual ammunition. Can I say that? We were outgunned. I'll say that too. We were under fire. And it was squirreling away in mud library with copies of policy review and commentary and uh, copies of Hayek 
and newsletters from state policy think tanks that really gave me the education that Oberlin should have been given. <laughs> it was the first-hand experience with the intolerance and the institutional racism of social engineers on these college campuses that forced me out of my shell. And we each have that moment in our lives where we've had to decide, are we going to sit on the sidelines, stay quiet, or stand up and fight? In one of the best speeches that Andrew ever gave at CPAC, he explained why he retweeted hate. And you know what I'm talking about, right? I know that every single one of you is on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Hashtag war. And he talked about the need to combat, quote, the false narrative of their innate intolerance. In one of our last conversations on a plane back from Michigan to the West, we were reminiscing about this, um, Andrew and I. And he was talking at the time about a poisonous demagogue uh, who has spread this idea of white privilege on campus, Tim Wise. And this guy had slandered and smeared not only Andrew, but many conservatives, foisting this idea that it was the right that was playing and preying on people's fears and hatred. It's the worst kind of psychological projection because they're the most divisive. They're the most racist. Racist. Just look at how they treat any minority of con conservative who dares to open his or her mouth. And you see it every single day. For me, it started with reprinting my hate mail, which I could make a living at, probably. <laughs> You've got hate mail. My next book. <laughs> Ding! <laughs> But it's very effective, and Andrew did it so well, to just hold up the mirror. And it's funny, because this is one of the most common refrains that you hear from progressive haters. How can you look at yourself in the mirror? Same way you do, with my two eyes open. How can you sleep at night? Uh, usually on my left side, sometimes on my back. But the idea that we don't care about the poor or the oppressed or those who yearn for more opportunity or more freedom. This is singularly the most important narrative that we must combat because, of course, it affects every public policy domestically. The idea that we don't care about children and that we don't care about the elderly when we're the ones who are defending the founding principles that erected this beacon for the world. And I think the first instinct, of course, is to say, how dare you? How dare you? But we also have to be happy warriors. And we have to show the benefits of living in a civil society that respects the rule of law, that respects and wants to increase and expand free markets, free minds, 
free speech. There's a reason why I have fought so passionately for issues like education. My own children are now 12 and 9. And the most important job that we have, whether we do it at home after school or formally round the clock, is that every, every single parent is a homeschooler, right? And this idea that's been foisted upon us by these progressives, and you see it popularized now by the messages on that cesspool MSNBC. If you saw the controversy over these ads with this woman, Melissa Harris Perry, who said that children belong to the collective. And it's been the rejoinder of conservative parents for years and decades now to these people that our kids are not your guinea pigs. Our kids are not your cash cows. Our kids are not your junior lobbyists. By the time they get to college campuses and people understand that low information voters are a problem, it's too late. We need to take the fight back all the way to the elementary school level and kindergarten and now preschool where Obama wants to universalize and collectivize three and four year olds. That's why something like the fight against Common Core is so important. And this dovetails, of course, with the need for a strong new media presence and the use of social media to get this story across. Social media is not merely for correcting false narratives. It's also for telling suppressed narratives and for understanding that in so many of the grassroots battles of the right, our enemies are not only the out of the closet, full Monty progressives and Ds, but a lot of infiltrators who pretend to be on our own side. And in some cases, they're our worst enemies. I cannot underscore, because I've seen it in the 20 odd years that I've been in this business, how revolutionized the industry and the niche of information gathering and media has become. I started out as an ink-stained wretch at the Los Angeles Daily News. And then I worked my way up to the Seattle Times and was able to um, start writing a syndicated column. I've written literally thousands and thousands of columns over the years that have been printed in, in dead tree newspapers. But I've always embraced new technology. And Glenn Reynolds, who is the godfather of the conservative and libertarian and limited government blogosphere and deserves a huge salute. <laughs> Wrote a book called Army of Davids and I highly recommend it particularly to young people who are in new media now or interested in uh, being in 21st century journalism. Because he talked about how technology has upended so many of the big establishment institutions. And it really is a celebration 
of the death and demolition of old media gatekeepers. Good riddance, RIP. When I started out, you had to go knocking and begging. I had to try and find a, an email address to use to beg the editors of the New Republic or the National Review or even Reason Magazine to please, 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 please take a look at some freelance piece, please. And uh, a lot of the gatekeepers were offended if you tried to solicit them. Even though they had publicly published their addresses. Don't bother me. <laughs> Who knew back then that the editor of the New Republic or the Atlantic Monthly would now be as powerful or as insignificant as someone with a nom de plume like Ala Pundit or a guy who used to run a call center operation, Ed Morrissey, or commenters on blogs who started their own blogs or a Jim Hoft at Gateway Pundit, on par with Andrew Sullivan. Why not? The democratization of the punditry world, of course, has that world up in arms. These control freaks lost control. And they've been mourning for years now. <laughs> <laughs> the power of the publish button, the spread of cheap and free blogging software, the crowdsourcing of investigative stories, whether it was those very early days when the Free Republic and Lucy Ann were the only games in town, and they deserve a lot of credit too when we talk about the history of new media and old new media. Whether we were talking about the days of Rathergate or uh, East St. Jordan, um, all the way through uh, the Bush years when so many mill bloggers out there were doing the work military bloggers I'm talking about, doing the work that the mainstream media would not do, talking about the successes of uh, the counterinsurgency in Iraq, righting the wrongs of the media that continued to tell this grim death toll story and bash America at any cost. It's it goes by, it's been happening so fast that sometimes we can't even appreciate just how amazing it is to talk the language of, even of Twitter now, and the hashtag. My kids talk in hashtag. <laughs> Clean your room, hashtag what? <laughs> and even that, I've talked about this before, the, the history of the hashtag, which is, in the spirit of the Russian samizdat and the underground, when people were trying to organize and subvert centralized, top-down government censorship. Now, the left-wing techies may not have intended that we use their technology for our own purposes, but that's what happens when you have open source media. And they should thank us for that because diversity is good. I know, I read it on a bumper sticker. <laughs> more choice, more technological innovation. These are all reasons for hope and optimism. And 
to repeat what's been said here, I don't believe that defeat is inevitable. If I did, I would have stopped getting up and waking up and running my mouth a long time ago. It is, it's a long journey and it's a long battle. And I think going forward, one of the things that is going to be so important is convincing young people to choose the right path. Our battles are not so much always between right and left as they are between right and wrong. One of the wonderful traits of new media and social media, and particularly in the conservative blogosphere over its history, has been its pride in being a self-correcting mechanism that, unlike the ideologues that we fight on the other side, that we can admit when we're wrong, be transparent about it, learn from our mistakes, and move forward. And I've made many, many, many of my own mistakes over my life. We have to conduct ourselves with the utmost of ethical behavior. And we have to lean on each other. There are going to be a lot of internal battles, and there have been over the past several years. There's a lot of rivalry. There's a lot of infighting. And I don't want people to fear that because that is something that, that is healthy, that we pride ourselves on the right, that we don't all speak on the same page on every issue. We don't all sing from the same hymn book and the same talking points like every Obama bot does in denying reality. But when push comes to shove, and when we're fighting for first principles, we have to remember not to dehumanize each other. One of the things that I respected and admired most about Andrew was his humanity. And in one of our last conversations, he was marveling at the time that Piers Morgan had said some nasty thing about him, you know, equated him to some sort of monster. And he was so earnest in his shock that Piers would think that way about him. When you're put in a box and compartmentalized, and of course we all know that's standard Alinsky tactics, it fits a certain narrative. And by repetition and demagoguery and centralized organization, these false narratives get plied over and over and over again. And it, it really doesn't take that much courage. It does take a little bit to stand up and say, stop. Stop the lies. And to do it with a smile on your face because you know it's not true. Happy warriors requires two elements, being able to fight, but also being able to know when it's time to take a break from that aggressive, combative tone all the time and enjoy what we have and to revel in each other's company and fraternity. I do want to leave that with you. If you go on Twitter and if you search the hashtag Breitbart or the hashtag Breitbart is here, page after page comes up. If I randomly look at the several thousand followers of mine 
on my timeline. It seems like one out of two or one out of three has Breitbart's name or Breitbart's picture. It is amazing what one person and one voice can do. And it's something that after he passed that I've tried to remind people over and over again. It doesn't matter, and he embodied this. It doesn't matter if you have one follower, five followers on Twitter, 20 readers of your blog, 50 likes on your Facebook page. Everybody, every voice makes a difference in this movement. And every skill set is needed. We need good communicators on TV and radio, sure. We need entertainers. We need number crunchers, lucid policy thinkers, good writers, good business people. Every voice counts. And I thank you for being here. I thank you for turning around tomorrow and the next day and the next day and committing yourselves, whatever your passion is. Keep that passion. Don't be told that you are doing wrong when you are acting right and keeping the faith. God bless you and God bless America.